Hello, this is Austin Hetzler, the pastor of Christ the Rock Church of Elyria, Ohio. We at Christ the Rock are humbled and grateful to get to be a part of your sanctification today as you watch or listen to this sermon. But at the same time, we want to encourage you to be a member of a good local church and not to allow online sermons to replace the local church and to benefit from the life of that church and to give your spiritual gifts back to that church. Having said that, our website is www.christrockchurch.com. If you go there, you can find sermons, blogs, and other resources, as well as our location and service times. You can also listen to the sermons on Bible Thumping Wingnut, Podbean, iTunes, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, and other podcast catchers. We also invite and encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube station. You can look it up or you can use the link to it that's found on our website. I, along with the membership of Christ the Rock Church, sincerely pray that this sermon will be a blessing. I pray that it would not be so to us, Lord. I pray that to us we would receive it as such that it is, which is the only reason we can truly rest in you. You can keep your people because we did not become your people by an accident of faith. We became your people by way of an eternal plan. And thus we have a salvation that is certain because all three persons of the eternal Trinity, eternal Father, eternal Spirit, eternal Son, they are in full agreement about who is redeemed and who is kept. And we revel in this reality, Lord Jesus. I pray that you give me grace in this time to express these things to your people in a compelling and accurate manner. I pray that you give them grace to receive these things. I pray that it changes their souls. I pray for those that may be in our midst that are unconverted. I pray that they would hear your voice even today and turn to you. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in last week's study, we saw the superficial of the crowd. That was exposed. Next week, we are going to consider their act of apostasy in contrast to the abiding faith of the true disciples. In between, in this week, we will receive along with them part of the explanation for their forthcoming abandonment of Jesus. And that explanation, in part, is the doctrine that we call limited atonement and the implications of this doctrine. In fact, explain why and how anybody walks away from Christ after having made a profession of faith. Limited atonement is the irrefutable biblical reality that Jesus died only for the Father's elect or for the ones that he chose. In our text, the people are engaged in a time of celebration, and that celebration is the feast of the Passover. This is the time when Jews look back upon that event that preceded their exodus from Egypt, in which God saved them through the blood of the Lamb applied to the side and top of the door. And He spared through that His people from the most severe plague that was poured out upon the Egyptians, the death of their firstborn sons. In John 6, we have the only Son of God, the true Passover Lamb, standing in front of the phony religious masses, exactly one year before the true Passover in which he will fulfill the greater intentions of the Passover and also at the same time the Day of Atonement. And he is here in this discourse explaining to them how all of this works. And in explanation of this, it's revealed that many of those listening will not be saved because although the message of salvation is to be given to everyone, Jesus did not atone for everyone because atonement is only provided for those that the Father draws and the Father only draws those whom He has elected. Now, if you and I scoured the Scriptures in an effort to find one supremely offensive doctrine, you could scarcely do better than this. And if you doubt the veracity of that claim, go and tell the common evangelical that Jesus didn't die for everyone. And I think you'll find out real quick 
that what I've just said to you is very much true. This doctrine has always been offensive. It was all the way back in John chapter 6 when it was explained by our Lord. That's part of the reason why all these people defect. This has always incensed sinful men because it reveals yet again that they really, truly have no hand in their own salvation. None. But incensed or not, they must hear it because it's true. And if our objective this evening is to know the truth, then we will not, as these foolish crowds soon do, walk away because we are offended. You need to know and understand that even wise men, even sincere Christians, when they study the Word of God, they are often encountered by things that they find deeply offensive. All right? Things that run against the grain of their own souls. This happens to all of us. The distinction between the wise and the foolish is that the wise press in in those moments rather than pulling away as a result of their offense because they realize that the offense that they gain from the Word of God is something that comes from them. It's not a deficiency in God. So then with that in mind, let us hear the Word of God to us this morning. I'm going to read to you John 6, 35 through 51. But then we will return to and focus on verses 37 through 40 and verse 44. John 6, starting in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now that is the section that we are addressing, which gives us the needed context. But again, we're going to hone in on verses 37 through 40, and again in verse 44. I'm going to expound the great truth of the doctrine known as limited atonement in seven points, and here I will waste no time. I'll get right to it. Point number one, if you reject limited atonement, you are most certainly, without a doubt, a heretic, because every legitimate Christian accepts this doctrine. Now, let me be very clear as to what I do not mean by that. I do not mean that if you reject the Calvinistic understanding of limited atonement, you're a heretic. I do believe there are Arminian Christians, and there are certainly four-point Calvinists who, though radically inconsistent, are brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a category known as Amaraldians. And so they hold to all the other letters of TULIP except the L. Those groups can still include genuine Christians because those groups still hold to a limited atonement. The only category that denies limited atonement truly is that of the universalist. The universalist is not a genuine Christian because they deny that anyone falls under judgment, ultimately, eternal judgment. They deny that anybody goes to hell. 
They believe in a truly unlimited atonement in that no one ultimately does not make it to heaven. No one ultimately is not saved. And that is, of course, very, very contrary to Scripture and the teachings of Jesus and the teaching of everybody else that God used to write Scripture. Thus, those people are obviously not Christians. But for those that are within the umbrella of Orthodox Christianity, we all accept a limited atonement. The disagreement pertains to who limits the extent of the atonement and how. Many denominations and individuals believe that people limit the extent of the atonement by rejecting Christ as a matter of their will. That is, however, contrary to our text, which states clearly, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. According to John, the atonement is limited by God the Father. And if the Father does not draw with irresistible grace, a sinner cannot come. Per Jesus' message to Nicodemus, unless that heart of stone is turned into a heart of flesh, the sinner will remain forever in their rebellion. Because of all the things that a heart of stone cannot do, it certainly cannot hear God. Because the sinner is the darkness that does not and in fact cannot comprehend the light who is Christ. John 1.5 Christians must therefore be born not of blood, that is to say not by right of human ancestry, for example, that of the Jew, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In John 1.13 because as John says in John 6.63 the flesh profits nothing, that which is earthly, you. You have nothing to contribute here does not say that the flesh only profits a little something. The flesh profits absolutely nothing. Therefore, if the Father does not draw sinners, they certainly cannot draw themselves. So if any are to be saved, the Father drawing them is the only way for that outcome to be achieved. Now, there are those who attempt to dismiss this divine exclusive drawing of the Father that we see in our passage on the basis of John chapter 12. Starting in verse 32 and going through verse 33, Jesus says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. All men in John chapter 12, verse 32, means all kinds of men. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, which was contrary to the prevailing wisdom of the day amongst the Jews, which was that only they as the sons and daughters of Abraham could truly receive the faith of Abraham. And to prove what I'm saying to you, consider the context that uh, occurs just prior to that saying. Just prior to saying he will draw all men to himself, Jesus was ministering to a group of Greeks. And in that message, he gives them a hope, a hope in him, a hope of salvation, And he does this in full purview of the bigoted Jews that were at that festival. John 12, 20 through 26. Now there were some Greeks, not Jews, among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Then these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, meaning of any ethnicity, the Father will honor him. All kinds of of people can be saved, not just the Jewish kind. And this is a constant theme in the Gospel of John from the very beginning. John 1, 5 says, I have to be born not of blood. I think that's John 1, 15, actually. John 2, 29, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world or of the nations, not just of the Jews in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world as in the nations 
and not just the Jews, following that conversation with one of the Jewish leaders for whom that information is very pertinent. And in John 4, there is the conversion of the Samaritans, which is the evidence of that great teaching. Now, there are many other verses in Scripture that are very similar to John chapter 12, verse 32, that the opponents of limited atonement will raise, and they will do exactly the same thing with those verses. They will take them out of context, and they will arrive at their conclusions on the basis of those contextual errors. All, always, has a context. As in our text, when Jesus says they will all be taught of God, per Isaiah's words, that does not mean everybody on the face of the earth. Obviously, because everybody is not taught of God. And so all always has a context. And ultimately, all the errors with this come down to that same uh, basic fundamental flaw in exegesis. Now, it's important to note here that the atonement is not limited by power. This is one of the things that our detractors raise against us. They will say that we believe that God is not powerful enough to save everyone. And it, limit God, it limits God that way. Let me explain to you the nature of Jesus. Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son, is infinite. Which is to say that irrespective how many people might be born, an infinite sacrifice will always be sufficient to atone for a finite number of souls. Because the finite can never uh, outdo or overwhelm the infinite. So he's not limited by power. He's limited as a matter of will. That is the will of God, though, not the will of man. A second point that I have for you this evening is that if you reject limited atonement as taught in our text, you greatly demean God's covenant love for his covenant people. Now, God loves all people in some sense, and I got excoriated for that about a week and a half ago online for having the audacity to say that God does love all people in some sense. I understand that God also at the same time hates the wicked and is angry with them every day, but we see this apparent paradox in God, and so we have to honor it. However, God does not love all people in the same way, not by a mile. The highest expression of God's love, that greatest peak and pinnacle of The love of God is reserved for his chosen people and it's revealed by Christ dying specifically for them. And though that is plain enough from our text, I will give you some additional passages to give clarity on the subject. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The love expressed there has a particular recipient. That's in the context of human marriage. Now, the way that I came to know my wife and the way that I came to love her is not that I spread out my affections amongst a group of women indiscriminately, and then it happened to stick to one, and so now she's my spouse. That's not the way that that works. I sought her out. It is the same with the affections of God. It is the same with the bride of Christ. He sought his bride out, and he purchased her with his blood. John 10, verse 15, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, not for those outside, not for the wolves, not for the goats, for the sheep. Acts twenty twenty eight. be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock which he, the Holy Spirit, has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased With his own blood. Believers are the flock. Unbelievers are not the flock. And the shepherd knows his sheep. And the sheep know his voice. And it is these and only these. For whom he has laid down his life. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this. That one lay down his life for his friends. John 11, 51 through 52. He being Caiaphas. Did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. That isn't God indiscriminately atoning for the sins of just anybody. That is 
The concept of a farmer going through a field and gleaning heads of wheat, but leaving the others, picking out this one, picking out that one from amongst the nations in which the elect of the Father are scattered. Without limited atonement, there is no unique, eternal love from God to His people. And those who reject limited atonement, very often the reason that they do this is to magnify God's love because it doesn't sound very loving, according to them, for God to only reserve His greatest category of love for a particular people. But the reality is, instead of magnifying the love of God, they diminish it and abuse it. Third point that I have for you is that if you reject limited atonement, you disregard the nature of the atonement offered by the Aaronic priests on the Day of Atonement, all of which was fulfilled by Christ. Aaron's priesthood, which is the Levitical priesthood, they offered the sign, and they themselves were a sign. Jesus, our great high priest, is the substance. He is the final and the true high priest. And they offered a sign of Christ's future atonement on the Day of Atonement. But in order for a sign to be a sign, it has to actually point to the substance or the real thing who is Christ. And if indeed it is capable of doing so, then it has to be consistent with the substance. If we say that the atonement of Jesus is offered on behalf of everyone rather than only those that the Father draws, then we completely contradict all that the Aaronic priesthood taught us about the nature of the priesthood and specifically the nature of the atoning work symbolically carried out by the priest on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. On that day, the priest goes in to that most holy of places, that most exclusive place in the temple, reserved for that occasion once a year, and who does he make atonement for on that day? The people that are gathered outside, the visible covenant community, marked by the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, and they are of the twelve tribes. Yom Kippur was never about every person on the face of the earth. It was about the covenant community. Jesus came to die for his people, the covenant community of God, the true covenant community, the universal church. And that is, in fact, why he was named Jesus. Matthew 1, 20 through 21. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. On the, Christ, on the cross, rather, Christ paid a particular sin debt. And you can see that there in that text in Matthew 1. It was their sins, the sins of his people. He did not atone for the sins of all people, as the Levitical priests before him did not offer symbolic atonement for all people on planet Earth. Fourth point that I have for you, is that if you reject limited atonement, you undo the Trinity by pitting the Son against the Father. You remember chapter 5 and the discourse that follows the healing of the lame man. Jesus so stressed the unity of the Father and the Son because you can't have two gods. And so in order for it to be one God, existing eternally in three persons, you have to have perfect unity between the persons of the Trinity. Let me remind you now. John 5, starting in verse 19 and skimming. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. Verse 21 For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. Verse 23, All will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Verse 26, For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. In the economy of salvation, which refers to the way that each person of the Trinity works in salvation together to achieve that end, The Father elects. Ephesians 1, 
3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. That is who the Father is drawing in John 6, and that is why, to the praise of the glory of his grace. The Son then works in perfect harmony to redeem only the Father's elect. Ephesians 1 goes on in verse 7 to say, In him, Christ, we, the Father's chosen ones, have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Our salvation was the fruit of an eternal plan wherein Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all according to the secret counsel of their will, foreordained the salvation of a particular people. And if you deny limited atonement, you deny the unity, between the Father and the Son, as taught in John 5 and Ephesians 1 and a thousand other places, if God did not by his own free will choose who he would receive atonement for, then we have the Father limiting the atonement to a particular people, and you have the Son in contradiction to that trying to save everyone. That cannot be. And then you have the Holy Spirit like a sort of adopted child trapped in the middle, helpless. That destroys everything that it means for God to be one being. When the Son raises up to eternal life on the last day, all that the Father has drawn, which is everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him according to the will of Him who sent Him, He is in perfect unity with the Father as a reflection of their perfect unity of being. Anything less than that corrupts the oneness of God. And so to the fifth point, if you reject limited atonement, you must redefine all the biblical terms that pertain to salvation. There are more than the ones that I have on my short list here, but this will give you a taste of what I mean. Start with vicarious atonement. Vicarious atonement is the biblical teaching that Jesus died on the cross to actually take the place of of sinners. Vicarious atonement is not vicarious atonement if it is not particular, because he isn't actually taking the place of anybody. He is potentially taking the place of everybody. Redemption. Redemption is not redemption if it is not actually applied. Every time you read that word, understand what it means. You redeem things all the time. It's used in our language in the same way that it is in Scripture. To redeem is simply to offer payment for something and then to purchase that thing, and then to gain possession of that thing. Redemption is not merely payment offered. And then the person then walks away with what you gave them, with that monetary exchange, without giving you that which you purchased. That's not redemption. Expiation, it's the same way. Expiation is not expiation if it does not actually expiate or release sinners from their sin, as well as providing the means by which this release is accomplished propitiation. It's not propitiation if it does not actually propitiate or make atonement for sin by making an acceptable sacrifice. To deny limited atonement or particular redemption, as I much prefer, is to make all of those things merely potential, which is totally contrary to their biblical definitions. In Scripture, God isn't trying to vicariously atone through Jesus. He isn't trying to redeem. He isn't trying to expiate sin. He isn't trying to provide a propitiation. He is actually doing all of those things. Thus, he really means it when he says that he's mighty to save. He actually is. According to his foreordained plan and decree, 
And a denial of that necessitates a fundamental redefinition of everything that the Bible teaches about salvation. Point number six. If you reject limited atonement, you make Christ out to be an overwhelming failure. That's what he is. Without the truth of this doctrine. And in fact, that's very much what he's addressing in our text. Right before these disciples desert Jesus, he is explaining to them and to everyone that their desertion does not demonstrate his failure or his father's failure. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And then why do they not believe? Right after that, in verse 37, all that the father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Very soon they're going to be walking away from Jesus because they hate his teaching. But right before that, he makes them very aware of the fact that their walking away doesn't demonstrate that God is a failed savior. It's just the fruit of their own rebellion. And in the perfect plan of God, he has chosen to leave them in their rebellion, at least in this time. Again, as I've said to you numerous times, perhaps some of them, and I think it's likely, come to Christ at a later point, perhaps in the book of Acts. These are some of the people that are reaped in that harvest. But if they are not ultimately converted, it's because they were not appointed to eternal life, according to the book of Acts, and they were not atoned for. When those perceived to be legitimate Christians walk away from Christ, it is never to be understood as a failure on God's part. The author of this gospel is also the author of a number of epistles. In 1 John, he wrote this concerning this subject. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, But they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? For example, all of the false converts in John chapter 6 that are about to walk away. John goes on to say, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Because the Father and the Son are one. And what they purpose cannot be different. And because they, along with the Spirit, are Almighty God, their purposes cannot be thwarted. And that then leads us to our seventh and final point for consideration. Limited atonement is a principal reason as to why our souls are eternally secure. Without this doctrine, no one's soul would be secure. You would have no assurance. Let me say no legitimate basis for that assurance. Listen to our Lord again, verses 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. But raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. In verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The preordained plan of God towards his saints can no more be thwarted than the crucifixion of Christ could that was given on behalf of his saints. Listen to Peter speak about the certainty of this action in Acts chapter 2 and the resurrection, starting in Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. 
Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That same presence and power that raised Jesus up again, putting an end to the agony of death, is going to be the God who raises all of us up on the last day, leaving none of us cast out because we were delivered also over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, not to be nailed to a cross, but to be redeemed by the one who was. And because he was put to death at the hands of godless men, you and I will live forever. And so, you see that though limited atonement is indeed a deep offense to the unbeliever, and it's also a great source of comfort to the true believer because it's the foundation of Christian assurance. The bride of Christ was elected before time. Their per- perfect particular atonement was provided 2,000 years ago. And the individual Christian's regeneration is the actuation of their redemption in real time. Do you understand what I just said? You're elected before time. You're not regenerate before time. That's fallacious. That's hyper-Calvinism. You are regenerate at the point in which you turn in faith and repentance to Jesus. It's the actuation of that. But the plan itself goes to long before our race was ever raised from the dust. And as Satan could not stop the atonement made by Christ, as he actually, in fact, took the actions that caused the foot of Christ to crush his own head, we can be sure that God who chose his elect will keep every one of us and that Christ will indeed raise us up on the last day. Now, there's a couple questions here that I want to address at the end. They come up every single time you talk about this sort of thing. One of those is, what effect does this have on our evangelism? Well, it has great effect on our evangelism because, first of all, you're giving the gospel to people who, some of whom, the Father's elect, will come to faith. You have that certainty that there is a foreordained plan of God and that in the church age we have been given the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Therefore, we will see converts. However, it does not limit who I give the gospel to on account of the fact that God in his great wisdom has not granted me prescience. Nor, as Spurgeon said, does anybody have a stamp on them somewhere that says elect. They don't know who the elect are. And so I give the gospel to all creation. And so that's the first question. Why do we give the gospel? We give the gospel because we have no idea who the elect are and we are commanded to preach the gospel to all creation. Second one is, well then, that, doesn't that ascribe some merit to the people who've been elected, to the people for whom Christ specifically died? No, it does exactly the opposite. However God chose his people, he didn't choose us on the basis of some intrinsic thing in us. In fact, if you want to know why you were chosen by God, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in which Paul says, not many of you were wise, not many of you were noble. It's not a compliment. So if, if there's any explanation at all as to why you were chosen, it's because, per that text, you're one of the foolish things of the world. Now that isn't to say that God's choosing is arbitrary. It's not. It's simply to say that whatever the reason he chose us was, it is far above my pay grade and yours. And it exists in his mind alone. And it has nothing to do with us. That's why the murderer uh, gets converted. And the self-righteous hypocrite very often does not. Although sometimes they do. Sometimes God 
saves the worst of us, and that's an explanation of the fact that his uh, election doesn't depend upon us. But I hope that these things and the consideration of them makes you more sure of your faith. Don't pull away from God on this basis. This doctrine is beautiful. And don't let Arminians destroy it for you. Understand and embrace the reality that you are a love gift if indeed you are in Christ. I see the principal uh, components of redemption. They're not people. You are the object being given from the Father to the Son, and then it is by way of the Spirit that we are redeemed, and all of them in perfect harmony are doing this. You, my friend, are the gift that is given for the glory of the giver, and he is in three persons eternally. Heavenly Father, give us grace. Lord, to appreciate these things, to honor you for your great wisdom revealed in them. Father, I pray that your people will take these things to heart. I pray that they will grow in their love for you as a result of this. Lord, if there be anybody here that does not know you, I pray that they would turn in simple saving faith to you this day, trusting in your perfect life to give them the righteousness which they lack and in your all-sufficient death to atone for their sins and in your resurrection through which they can be resurrected to eternal life as well. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.